So welcome everybody. Um, I wish a very warm welcome to um, everybody joining us today on the webinar on circular water and sanitation. Um, this is our fifth and final session of our webinar series on circular cities in action, a deep dive into five priority sectors for cities. And um, I'm very happy to welcome you today on behalf of ECLE's um, circular development team at the ECLE World Secretary. My name is Rebecca Westenhage, I'm Transition Concepts Officer at the World Secretariat of ICLE, and I'll be your facilitator for the day. Um, before we start with the session, um, we'll have a few housekeeping notes um, just for you to um, take note of. First of all, our session today is recorded, and as um, for all of the other parts of our webinar series, the recordings will be made available afterwards on the ECLE Circulars website. You see the link here coming up on the slide and it will also be shared in the chat. Um, speaking of the chat, um, this is also um, an opportunity where we encourage you to introduce yourself and um, share which city or organization you're joining today from to get connected to the fellow um, attendees of um, the webinar today. And you can also use the chat to reach out to the team in case you have any logistical questions. Um, during our um, presentations of today, um, we encourage you to use the Q&A function to um, post your questions and we'll have a Q&A session to answer them at the end of the session. Um, and um, feel free also, or it would be uh, good if you also indicate who you address your question to, uh, so we can make sure it comes to the, to the right person. Um, I think with that said, um, I just have a little um, recap of the um, webinar series that we had so far. So uh, the series is organized by ECLE Circulars under the Circular Lab for Cities program. And um, we had the pre uh, previous sessions focused on plastics, um, buildings and construction, food and agriculture and fashion and textiles. And you can see here um, how um, a diverse selection of cities and partners we had speaking at our previous sessions. And all the recordings are already available on the Circulars website again. Um, also, the link will be shared in the chat. Um, coming to today's session on water and sanitation, um, I just uh, run through the agenda with you quickly. So we'll hear first a thematic introduction on um, both our circle, um, Sorry, um, on our Circular Cities Action Framework from Gary Hoffman from the ECLE World Secretariat. Um, then we'll have a deep dive introduction into um, circular water and sanitation um, from uh, Daphne Gondalikar, Chair of the Urban Water Systems Engineering at the Technical University in Munich. And then we'll have a um, practical case from Haley Tompkins, Water Program Coordinator at the City of Guelph in Canada. So very warm welcome to our speakers um, as well. Um, as said, afterwards, we'll have a Q&A session with all three speakers. So um, make sure if something comes up during the presentations to post it in the Q&A so we'll be able to address it afterwards. Um, yeah, with that said, and without further ado, I'll hand over to the first um, speaker of the day. So Paris, um, the floor is your, yours, and we're happy to have an introduction um, on a deep dive into circular water systems. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. And good morning or good afternoon or good evening from uh, wherever you're joining us today. Um, so I will be taking you into um, what circular water systems are. So looking at it from a, a value chain perspective. Um, and maybe we can just switch to the next slide. Um, so maybe we can take a moment first to appreciate um, what water is and how water works in our ecosystems. So I think it's really interesting to actually think about how water um, is really a circular resource and that um, the world's water system functions in a circular way. Uh, we have uh, rain and evaporation and um, the ocean. So I, I really appreciate thinking about that. And um, if we look at the definition, um, on circular water systems. We see that um, circular water systems offer a lens um, to look at water systems from a value chain perspective um, to minimize extraction and maximize recovery in a systemic manner. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Um, so if we look at the linear uh, system of using water, 
um, we're already looking at the take make waste model so where we're taking resources from the ecosystems um, making products and then um, wasting and uh, next up we're going to go into the challenges that this system poses so um, we see from the ecosystem side that um, our availability of potable water supplies is actually diminishing and it's projected that by uh, 2050 about uh, 6 billion people will be suffering from clean water scarcity according to a UN report um, so this really shows that we need to be um, yeah, more systematic in how we use water and how we think about this valuable resource uh, next slide, please. Um, so we also see that um, there's inefficient um, green stormwater infrastructure. So there's um, inefficiencies in how water is used in our urban uh, systems. And urbanization alters the land cover and use, um, which typically then increases impervious surfaces such as asphalt, concrete, and buildings. Um, so this is another challenge that we're seeing. Um, the next up, um, there's also the lack of wastewater treatment. So we see that on average, high income countries treat about 70% of the municipal and industrial wastewater, uh, while low income countries treat only about 8%. Um, so there's a need to also increase um, the use of water treatment facilities. Then we also see that um, there's inefficiencies in uh, using potable water. Uh, so we're facing losses also in countries like the US where uh, there's over 2.2 million miles of underground drinking water pipes. Um, but even there, they then suffer from uh, losing resources as they um, see water main breaks approximately every two minutes. So that's a very impressive number as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, then we also see at the end of li life that uh, nutrients are not fully recovered. So nutrient recovery from wastewater and recycling nutrients as soil fertilizers uh, is a major challenge that we see for the future of the circular economy. Um, then if we look at circular water systems now with um, the systems perspective, we see that there is actually a diverse range of strategies um, that aim at closing resource loops and maximizing our resource efficiency to ensure that water consumption respects and protects ecosystems boundaries um, while also having a nature positive impact. Uh, so if we look at this in more detail, um, I would like to go to the next slide to talk about uh, the circular city actions framework. Um, so this is a framework that we've developed um, in within the Circle Lab for Cities program, uh, together with our partners, Circle Economy, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and metabolic. And as you can see here from this diagram, uh, we have five strategies um, that can be used holistically in cities um, to have different entry points for the circular economy and uh, value chains. So this is um, really a hands-on way to categorize and to um, strategize across value chains, um, how to approach um, them in a circular fashion. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, this gives more detail on the actions framework. So it's really geared towards um, the different roles that local and regional governments can play, but it also addresses um, the role of stakeholders within um, the circular economy for uh, all value chains. Um, and next up, we'll go through um, the different strategies in more detail. Uh, so you can see here um, where these strategies come in uh, along the circular uh, value chain. So before um, resources are extracted, we have uh, the rethink strategies that are really about rethinking um, how we treat this resource or if we re really need to extract this in the first place. Um, then second are the strategies around regenerate. So here we're really looking to um, harmonize with nature to make sure that we're not just taking resources, but we're actually giving back to nature and using nature-based solutions, for example. Um, then the re reduced strategies are all about then making the most out of what we have and reducing um, our consumption and our further extraction. Um, while we reuse then make sure that um, the resources are, resources are kept in the loop for longer. Um, and then lastly, this is really the last, um, yeah, I guess in the hierarchy of waste, you're also familiar with uh, this being the last step. Um, so recovery is only then the last uh, means to then 
um, take back the materials and put them back into the cycle. And now we'll go through um, different examples for um, circular washer and these uh, and these five R strategies. So um, the first example here is uh, Hammerby. It's a closed loop district in uh, Stockholm, and it was designed um, to use uh, synergies among water, energy, and transportation services. So, for example, water in this district is used. Um, for district heating, but then if the heat is uh, extracted from this water, then um, this can also be used for district cooling. So there is an opportunity here to then look at how we can use this resource in a closed uh, loop system within city districts. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, so here, um, this example in Brasilia um, shows that um, they really had a water crisis, uh, high water crisis levels in 2016. And to ensure that um, the water sources are um, able to naturally recharge, um, a group of stakeholders collaborated to reforest springs and um, the urban watershed. So I think since 2019, they'd uh, recovered about 25 of these water sources. And um, they're also using these lands now um, for organic um, agriculture to also ensure that these um, lands are reforested and used in a sustainable manner that then also ensures that they um, are preserved for the city. Then the next um, example is an example for Reduce. So in Zaragoza in Spain, um, the Water Saving City program was initiated in 1996 to um, uh, resolve water scarcity. And as part of this, um, they've held several awareness raising campaigns um, that are about um, encouraging citizens to reduce uh, their water use and prevent uh, waste. And they've also used water tariffs um, to disincentivize overuse while also ensuring that low income households are not adversely affected um, by this measure. And after 15 years of the strategy being in place, they achieved a reduction of water consumption by almost 30%. And this is then mainly due to um, behavioral changes they saw in water use, both by um, their residents, but then also by the businesses. Then the example for reuse um, is looking at the city of Windhoek in uh, Namibia. And the city is um, really facing water scarcity because 83% um, of the rainwater evaporates um, while they cannot benefit from nearby water resources. So. Uh, Windhoek was actually one of the first cities in the world to reduce um, domestic wastewater um, or to reuse domestic wastewater uh, for human consumption. So they started doing this in 1968. Um, and they're also ensuring that this um, infrastructure is being maintained by um, building it out as needed. And they use um, technologies that mimic nature. Um, so they are using an activated sludge process and um, maturation bonds. Uh, pond, sorry, to eliminate um, health hazards here. And then lastly, um, an example for recover is uh, Singapore's uh, approach to uh, derive drinking water from sewage. Um, so Singapore as a uh, city state um, also faces uh, water security issues and they actually import half of their current water supplies um, from Malaysia. And one of these strategies to overcome this problem um, is a membrane technology that they're using to treat wastewater. So it goes through several membranes and this um, ensures that they have higher water security while also ensuring economic, social and environmental benefits. Um, so you can find more examples of um, city-led uh, actions on water and on other um, value chains uh, on the Knowledge Hub that we collaborated with um, Circle Economy. So here um, we have over 450 case examples where cities are leading on these examples. Um, and if we go to the next slide. Uh, some more information on Circle Lab for Cities. Um, so the Circle Lab for Cities program is um, funded by the MAVA Foundation and implemented by ICLE, Circle Economy Metabolic and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And the aim of this program is to support cities worldwide um, to take the next step in their circular journey. And this we're doing through online and offline tools that support circular development, uh, planning and implementation at local level. 
And so through this program, um, cities can explore circular solutions implemented by peers, uh, scan their urban metabolism, and then act to advance their transition to circular economy and priority sectors. So if we go to the next slide. Mm. So about a month ago, um, we launched Ganbate.world in collaboration with uh, Circle Economy. And this platform is, um, provides data for over 600 cities um, to then prioritize circular solutions, um, also using a value chain perspective. So we have um, collaborated with them to pilot um, this tool with uh, 10 different cities worldwide. Um, and then you are invited to um, look up the tool and look up your city and see um, the data that we have here. And then um, the benefit of this tool is that it shows um, data per city level and then it also uh, shows relevant case examples. So you're welcome to uh, check out this tool. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, there's more information on uh, the city cases. So. Um, Ganbate provides um, data for over 6,000 cities worldwide on um, material usage, um, the emissions that are linked to these uh, materials, as well as jobs. And then this uh, overview allows city practitioners to identify um, possible intervention points and then find the right circular solutions for their city using the case examples. Then uh, thank you very much. And I hand back over to Rebecca. Thank you so much, Karius, for this introduction and for pointing out the different challenges along the linear water systems and um, also informing us about the different entry points um, to make water systems more circular um, through the Circular Cities Action Framework. Um, I think it's great to see um, that cities are already quite active in this field and that we have heard some concrete examples now where actually cities are already leading on the different steps of the framework. Um, Yes, I can only um, once more encourage everybody to um, browse the Eclipse Circulars website, where, where also the different tools and programs that Keris introduced are um, yeah, available and you find more information on those. Um, yeah, then without further ado, I would hand over to our second speaker of the day. So um, Daphne Gondalica from the, um, or the chair of the Urban Water Systems Engineering at the Technical University in Munich, sorry. Um, and Daphne will uh, continue the thematic introduction um, by going into um, water recycling and water circularity more in depth and uh, linking to specific projects that um, yeah, have run through her um, department. So Daphne, the floor is yours. I'll stop my screen share and hand over to you. Super, thank you. So thank you very much for having me today. I'm absolutely delighted to join. And uh, I would like to talk a little bit about um, what we are calling the Nexus City and uh, water reclamation with resource recovery um, as a key action point for transforming cities to net zero carbon. So the basic challenge that we're looking at is that cities are consuming very high levels of natural resources, such as water, but also energy and food. And this is um, because cities are built with very linear resource intensive infrastructure systems that were conceptualized or conceived 100 years ago or more and these um these infrastructure systems are very much key to driving um high levels of greenhouse gas emissions and therefore climate change so in order to think about how cities can transition to net zero carbon we need to think about where the key action points are to lower greenhouse gas emissions and um, how infrastructure systems play a role in that. And water is a key starting point here for us to reimagine cities and they, how they work. So we look at the water energy food nexus approach as an integrated urban planning framework. So the nexus approach basically says that water, energy and food are inextricably linked. Um, and because they're interlinked, there is a potential to close loops by looking at them in conjunction. However, cities usually plan in, within sectors um, conventionally, the water sector is um, regarded separately from the energy sector and separately from, from the transportation or from the solid waste management sector. So there is a lot of synergy opportunities here that are not being leveraged on, for example, to conserve water and energy or to make um, the use of resources more efficient. 
Um, and here, obviously, in such a complex system, the governance um, is very much key to being able to implement that. But implementing this nexus approach can also support the implementation of the SDGs and the integrated aspects that the SDGs have inherent in them. Um, the nexus approach so far has rarely been implemented at urban scales, so that also is a huge um, opportunity. A few cities like Rajkot in India or Växjö in Sweden have managed to take a cross-sectoral approach and thereby lowering their greenhouse gas emissions very, um, very substantially. So we need to think about having more nexus pilot projects in order to also generate evidence on how this cross-sectoral approach could work in terms of technical aspects, but also governance. So um, a quick pitch on my research group at TUM, we have the TUM Nexus Lab or Nexus at TUM, where the basic hypothesis is, again, to say that we need integrated or circular urban nexus planning in order to tackle climate change effectively. Um, and there are many cross-sectoral opportunities to cutting greenhouse gas emissions, taking water as a starting point. So we try to formulate alternative development pathways for cities. Um, and look at all kinds of sectors, not just water, energy, and food, but also solid waste, mobility, ecosystems, health, to name a few, can also be others, depending on the individual context. We also try and um, bring out climate change mitigation and adaptation approaches synergies um, in order to enable cities to tackle several problems with targeted actions that can look at um, different problems at the same time. Um, and we are working in a number of case study cities, particularly in India, um, in, in Asia and in Africa as regional focus. So if we look at um, what Charis already was touching on, the opportunity um, of water recycling, we can see that worldwide, as has already been mentioned, um, the recycling rates are, are relatively low. So um, worldwide, only 12% of water that has been treated is intentionally recycled. Of course, there's a lot of water recycling that's unintentional and that is not, um, not visible in these graphics, but we can easily see that in different regions, um, the amount of water reuse varies completely. Um, and the only thing that seems to stand out is that once there is a, a necessity to recycle water, for example, like in the um, example from Singapore that we saw, or um, Israel is very good on water recycling, um, or some other states that have very, very dry Cyprus, for example, very dry climates are good at water recycling. So technically it's completely possible, but some countries just don't really see the need yet. For example, Germany, um, this um, intentionally reuse of treated water is below 1% because we have not seen the need yet. But with climate change, also drought conditions in some parts of Germany are increasing. So the need, to recycle water or to rethink how we use water is definitely growing. So there's a huge opportunity here. And as I said, um, already cities uh, have um, these infrastructure systems in place that have been conceptualized a hundred years ago or more that are very water and energy intensive, for example, sewage systems. And these systems are also old and now um, falling apart literally in some cities and need to be maintained. There are great studies on this um, for the city of Munich, but also in the context of the US, it's very, very expensive to keep these systems up and running. So it's a good time to think about whether it's still um, ethically also viable to flush our toilets with drinking water and to use 130 liters per person per day, um, even if we have enough water in Germany, um, if we want to be a model for development in water, more water scarce areas. And uh, there's a lot of resources that we can recover, especially from this wastewater. We don't like calling it wastewater. We prefer to call it use water or reuse water. Um, so 99.9% .9 of this uh, water that comes in, in the sewer system is actually water. So we can recover that, but also energy is a very inherent resource that we can recover. From, from this waste water, quote unquote. So methane is there, um, which can be co-digested with organic waste, for example. We can also recover um, nutrients for, for agricultural purposes, but there are also other resources in the water. For example, um, biological plastics can be made out of this waste water. Um, we can recover antibiotics that is being done in some places. We can recover salts and uh, minerals and all kinds of uh, things. 
And uh, the markets for these recoverable resources are only just emerging in our world where we are beginning to see um, um, less of a um, less easy access to some resources, for e example, fertilizers um, and so on. And decentralized systems in particular can enhance resource recovery simply because smaller um, sewage systems in particular have uh, less water in them, so these resources are less diluted. So speeding up a little bit, and to avoid taking too much time, I would like to um, show you one of our case studies that we're working on. This is the town of Leh in Ladakh in India in the in Himalayas, and this is a high altitude semi-arid context where a small town was exposed um, a short time ago to very um, huge tourism industry growth, and the result was that a huge amount of water um, is being extracted from groundwater aquifers, um, which is not being regulated, so there is some concern about um, depletion of water resources. So we've been working in Leh for 10 years now to um, advocate water recycling with resource recovery or water reuse and trying to show different technical options for how that is possible and also facilitating a multi-stakeholder process to have a dialogue on this. So I would like to jump straight into a documentary film that I'm going to show you for five minutes what the context looked like and then give some explanation as a basis for the discussion. So I'm going to start the video. To envision an alternative urban future, we go to Ladakh in the Indian Himalaya. Ladakh is a semi-arid high altitude region. Water is scarce in Ladakh and has always been precious. Water has been managed very carefully for centuries in agricultural settlements. The town Leh is the cultural capital of Ladakh. The historic center overlooks a green oasis of agricultural fields. Until very recently, Ladakh was virtually isolated from the modern world. Since opening to tourism in the 1980s, Leh has expanded very rapidly. Leh has only 60,000 inhabitants, but now receives 180,000 tourists annually, mainly from India. Due to the extreme Himalayan climate, most tourists come in summer. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, visits Leh every summer. Thousands of visitors come to see him. The growth of the tourism industry in Leh has caused a huge increase in water demand. In the 1980s, there were only a handful of hotels. Since then, around 350 hotels and guest houses have opened. Many are still in construction or being planned. Urban growth has been extremely rapid and Lee continues to grow. Adequate fresh water supply and wastewater management are a huge challenge. Uh, population of Leh has been expanding almost exp exponentially, you know, because of tourism and migration. So the demand for water has definitely increased, you know, and uh, there are no easy options, uh, I would say. An alternative solution, as suggested by research, to address water, energy and food issues comprehensively, is decentralized wastewater recycling and reuse in the agricultural area of Leh. Wastewater collection in small clusters of hotels, guest houses, and households would reduce piping and require less water for flushing. Recycled water could be used to recharge the aquifer locally. Energy would be conserved as less water has to be extracted or lifted to barren fields from the planned central STP. Smaller treatment plants could run on solar energy. Recycled water could be used to regenerate barren fields 
and grow cash crops with continued use of organic fertilizer, improving food security. The decentralized option is more flexible and thus resilient under climate change related water uncertainty. This example of the town lay shows that in order to conserve natural resources, water, energy, and food need to be planned together. Under climate change, implementing business as usual solutions, such as centralized sewage systems, is a risk. Cutting our overconsumption of water, energy, and food to sustainable levels is at the root of stopping climate change, ending exploitation of people, and enabling a peaceful future. For this, visionary solutions are urgently needed in cities worldwide that are suited to local conditions. I think we have to develop definitely. We can't continue in the old ways, but it has to be something, you know, which is sustainable, uh, which is suited to the local environment, culture, and uh, and I'm sure, you know, if we think seriously about an alternative, there are alternatives. Okay, so that's what we try and do. We try and think very seriously about alternatives. And um, here's what we are proposing in Lee to basically... Um, substitute the planned centralized system, which in the last 10 years also has been built, but now it's not working very well, which uh, used a lot more water than the town was supplying before, which again used a lot more energy than the town was using before, which has a lot more emissions, um, and putting decentralized clusters um, um, of hotels and guest houses together into smaller water recycling units that can also recover resources, as I explained um, in the movie as well. And we also um, have been advocating to link this to a governance approach whereby the water managers that are traditionally in place in Lee um, can expand the role into resource managers and also um, be responsible for these clustered um, management of uh, water recovery, nutrient recovery, and also running these um, small, smaller scale um, yeah, energy recovery units. So in trying to generate evidence for, for this um, approach, and the numbers are very, very important because we've uh, had many meetings with the city and every time they said, well, that sounds great, but what's it gonna cost? Or how, much, how many greenhouse gas emissions are you gonna save? So um, we try to um, uh, calculate some of these things using one uh, technology alternative called a constructed wetland approach and we did manage to show how the greenhouse gas emissions of this would be substantially lower than implementing a centralized system because the the treatment of the wastewater in particular would be a lot less energy intensive we showed that if it was implemented in in one area of lay like this um, putting together about 20 or 30 guest houses and hotels um, and some households we could basically irrigate about two hectares of field that is currently barren and that would produce so and so much cabbage so that has a market value. Um, we showed how much pumping energy could be decreased um, what the energy generation could be in terms of biogas so it could yield um, about eight cubic meters of methane per day which is enough to cook for 30 or 40 people per day. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot um, of course but it also could have other impacts like making um, like an organic uh, um, tourism strategy, more transparent, or by um, just showing how re resource recovery could work. And we also showed that organic fertilizer of 12 tons per year could be recovered. So this is like a model um, that we're working on that could also work in other cities in India and also other countries. And of course, when we had been working in India for some time, our colleagues said, but you, why don't you work on your city as well? So we approached the city of Munich with a similar um, idea. We had a study to show how much uh, water could be reclaimed within the central district of Munich called Max Vorstadt, where our university is located. Um, we showed that the water demand for toilet flushing can be met by rainwater because we have plenty of rain falling on our heads. And at the moment, we just try and avoid flooding. We're not using rainwater actively. 
So that's a huge um, potential. We could recover biogas also decentrally from sewage, mixing it with organic waste. And in theory, we could meet 20% of local household electricity demand with this um, stable and available source of energy. Um, and we could even roll out urban agriculture hugely um, and generate a substantial amount of our fruit and vegetable demand um, very locally using recycled water, using our recycled organic fertilizer. Um, and we took that back to the city and they just said, well, how would you ever, could you ever implement that? And of course, that's um, the whole point. I mean, there would have to be a huge dialogue and it would be very expensive um, because you would need a dual piping system and all kinds of things. But if you weigh it against the cost of what it would be to keep renovating the centralized sewage system, it might pay off. So we showed that it, the cost could be recuperated within two years. And of course, that's a super rough estimate. but we think it's worthy of more attention and more research. So basically, um, to conclude, um, many cities worldwide now need to evaluate whether the infrastructure systems that they have in place and maintaining cost intensive um, and resource intensive systems is sustainable given climate change. And we need to develop new models and also test them to see how they would work technically, but also in terms of governance. We need new business models. We need new um, even governance uh, systems. And um, our basic hypothesis is to say that these hybrid or decentralized solutions to some of the issues around water management may be lower than maintaining these conventional systems. But technical alternatives are not really available yet. We don't really have a catalog yet where we can pick and choose. And that's why pilot projects are so important to try these out to see how they would work, who would manage them, how much it would cost and so on. And this whole huge potential in terms of lowering greenhouse gas emissions, um, particularly also through methane capture and generating revenue, new revenue streams from these recovered resources like water, energy and nutrients and other um, things. So that is what we're trying to do with the Nexus approach. And I thank you very much for your attention and hope I haven't gone that too much over time. Thank you so much, Daphne, and uh, know you were very well inside your time. Um, thank you for um, introducing to us the um, water energy food nexus approach and the in interlinkages. And I think we're all aware of the governance challenges of integrating between different sectors. So great to see that Reichert and Vaxio are already leading in that front and uh, we have examples to learn from here. Also, it was really interesting to learn about the challenges and opportunities of uh, water reclamation and recycling. And the lay example that you shared also in the um, video very much illustrated what can be done concretely. So I think that also helps to have a very yeah, concrete um, understanding and approach into the topic. And lastly, it was super interesting to hear from you um, where you see kind of the, the co-benefits and um, yeah, the, the outcomes that come um, from water treatment and recycling in terms of um, agri agriculture. And also um, that sometimes we really shy away from looking at the cost and um, yeah, kind of what it really needs to rethink systems, which is also the first step of our framework. And I think this is very much uh, or very often the most challenging. So to see that potentially um, there is not a very much, uh, very long time span where these things can pay off in the end, I think that's very important to remember and um, yeah, to guide our future actions. So thanks a lot for that. And um, I encourage everyone once more to post the questions to Daphne in the Q&A uh, section so we can address it afterwards. Um, so I now hand, now hand over to um, our third speaker of the day. So Hayley, um, who is the Water um, Program Coordinator from the City of Gelb. Welcome Hayley. And Hayley will um, introduce to us um, how they're working with private households in Gelb. Um, through a water rebate systems for grey water reuse and rainwater harvesting. So um, Haley, we're excited to hear about you and please feel invited to share your screen. Great, thank you so much. I appreciate the introduction, Rebecca, and for uh, your team to invite me here today. It's great to, to speak with all of you. Uh, so as Rebecca said, my name is Haley. I am the Water Program Coordinator with the City of Guelph, and we're located in Ontario in Canada. And so today I'm gonna share with you the City of Guelph's vision and mission and why water conservation is so important for our city. 
Afterwards, I'll provide a bit of an overview about our innovative rainwater harvesting and gray water reuse rebate programs for our residents and how that fits within the, today's greater theme of circular water and sanitation. And so the city of Guelph is a mid-sized city. We're located in Southern Ontario, Canada, along the Innovation Corridor. So this runs between two other major cities, Toronto and Kitchener-Waterloo. And at the city of Guelph, we really work to deliver high quality services and programs for our residents. And this work is inspired and driven by our corporate vision and mission. Our vision for Guelph is creating an inclusive, connected, prosperous city where we can look after one another and our environment. Our mission is to work together to deliver responsible and responsive public service to Guelph's growing and diverse community. Our vision and mission is reflected um, and it helps direct our corporate strategic plan as well. And so our strategic plan, which we've called Guelph Future Ready, reflects the aspirations of our council, our city staff and our community. And this is what we're using to help drive us forward to a more sustainable future. And so the plan includes five strategic priorities that aim to improve sustainability across uh, many areas while working towards improved community well-being. And so especially uh, relevant to today's presentation is this sort of sustaining our future piece. Uh, this is where we're working to care for the local environment, respond to climate change, and prepare Guelph for a net zero carbon future. So the nice thing about living in Guelph is there's such a huge passionate community that really cares about the environment and the city has responded by being a leader in sustainability. And so this is reflected in our strategic plan, as well as in some of our achievements like our award winning water efficiency and source water protection programs that help us create and contribute to our high quality and reliable water supply for our city. These water protection initiatives are really important for Guelph because of our dependence on a really constrained water supply. So the city of Guelph is Canada's largest groundwater based community and groundwater, um, if you're unfamiliar, is water from rain and snow that melts um, or that seeps sorry, into the earth through open spaces and cracks in the rocks and soil. Then we have municipal wells that reach deep below the surface to access that water that we use throughout our city. So groundwater can be found almost everywhere, but not usually in these large enough quantities to meet the needs of an entire city. And so Guelph is very lucky to be located on top of a large, naturally filtered and well-protected groundwater supply that can meet our current drinking water needs. But because it takes a long time for water to filter through the ground, we can easily use this water faster than it's replenished. And so our challenge then is that our city's water supply is more vulnerable to overuse and drought compared to, let's say, surface water supplies like lakes or rivers. So our groundwater then is extremely valuable because unlike our surface water alternatives, it requires very little treatment to meet our drinking water quality standards. Guelph is also one of the fastest growing cities in Canada and is designated as a settlement area within our places to grow, which is the province of Ontario's 30 year growth plan. Right now, our population is anticipated to increase from about 135,000 to almost 170,000 people within the next 10 years alone. And so with this growth in community, we have, of course, an increase in water demand. So we saw earlier this unsustainable model of the take, make, waste, and this is really what has driven us to embrace the principles of a circular economy, where our focus is on reducing and reusing our water resources instead of sending it directly to our wastewater treatment plants, where we would be bringing that resource uh, to its end of life there. So as I've said, the city of Guelph relies on groundwater, uh, which is effectively a finite supply. And so for us pursuing water efficient technologies to reduce our water usage and reusing treated water is viewed as a high priority in the city of Guelph. The support for our water conservation um, has driven the city of Guelph to actively pursue these water efficiency and conservation programs since 1998 and has allowed us to become a national leader in water efficiency. 
And so we really want to reduce water usage by doing better with less water. So this means supporting infrastructure that's designed to minimize water use from production to end of life, and by allowing us to use that water more efficiently and for longer. So our 2006 and then our subsequent uh, 2014 water supply master plans evaluated our options then for meeting this increasing water demand over the next 50 years. And so water conservation continues to be recognized as the most readily available and cost effective source of new water for our community. And so in response to this, we developed our award-winning water efficiency strategy, which was then implemented. And since 2006, the city has invested over $10 million in our water conservation programs. So this investment of, of $10 million has successfully delayed the need for plant infrastructure expansions by over $40 million and has translated into annual operational savings of just over $500,000 per year. So for our water efficiency programs, uh, they have generated a savings of about $4.68 for every $1.31 of spending. And so these robust water efficiency programs really target our diverse audiences. Uh, it involves working with local partners and connecting directly with our customers, which are the residents in our community. So these programs really help us to push the industry and encourage the adoption of our innovative water technologies, enabling us to reach our aggressive water reduction targets for the city. And so an opportunity that arose for us to explore the use of two related ongoing innovative programs meant to further water conservation in Guelph. And this includes our all season rainwater harvesting and our gray water reuse rebate programs. And so the systems um, in place here really reduce community water demands by collecting and using water that would have otherwise been wasted from being immediately directed into our stormwater or wastewater systems. So our first rebate here for our residents is our all season rainwater harvesting. And this involves collecting rainfall and snow melt from a hard surface. So for our residents, typically the roofs of their homes or, or other buildings on their property, filtering it and then storing it for later use. So in Canada, where we have very cold winters, uh, in order to prevent this water from freezing, we have holding tanks where the water is stored. Typically, these are located underground or indoors. That rainwater that's captured is treated within that system with ultraviolet light, and it can then be used to do things like flushing toilets, washing laundry, and supplying hose bibs for outdoor watering. So while it is being treated with UV, it's not treated to our drinking water quality standards, but it, as you can see, it still has many beneficial uses within the home. And then we have our gray water reuse system, and this involves collecting, treating, and storing the water that you use while showering or bathing that would otherwise go down the drain. And so all the municipal water supply to Guelph homes is of potable or drinking water quality. And so with standard plumbing, the water that's provided to all of the fixtures within the home, including our toilets, is the same quality as the water that we drink. And, and Daphne touched on this um, in, in their presentation that you know, our potable water is not required for toilet flushing. And so this means that the water is being wasted and very inefficiently used especially when you consider how vulnerable Guelph's drinking water source is, it's really important that, you know, we're working to minimize water waste. And so this gray water system would filter the water, would treat it with chlorine, would store it, and it would be made available for things like toilet flushing in your home. And so this means that you would no longer be using clean drinking water just to flush your toilets. So this helps our residents help us save water and it saves them money as well. And so while we were developing our 2006 water efficiency strategy, you know, we had a lot of public consultation that revealed that our community and policymakers were really open to opportunities to pilot and test new water saving technologies, including this gray water reuse and rainwater harvesting program. 
And so in 2009, the city initiated a residential gray water reuse field test to assess the feasibility of a large scale adoption of home based gray water reuse technologies. And so this field test was supported with funding from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and was a partnership as well with local builders in the University of Guelph. And so we had 25 homes that had gray water reuse systems installed, and this included 10 new build homes and 15 existing homes that were retrofitted to include this technology. And over time, we would monitor the water quality of the gray water produced by their system uh, for a period of a year. And then we would have a final water quality sample taken two years after the system installation. Additionally, we also monitored household water use and participants were able to provide feedback of their experiences through forums, interviews and surveys, and this helped us get a better understanding for their attitudes and experiences towards these technologies. And so through this field test, the city was available, uh, able to evaluate the social, economic and environmental impacts associated with implementing sort of these home based reuse technologies, as well as the addition uh, the appropriate um, municipal frameworks that were required for managing these decentralized water supply alternatives. And so these field tests were uh, really effective. They identified both opportunities as well as lessons learned, but ultimately, you know, we supported the addition of rebate programs for these decentralized water supply systems um, to our forward thinking water efficiency programming within the city. And so following this successful field test, we began offering rebates of up to $2,000 for our all season rainwater harvesting system to residents and $1,000 for our gray water reuse systems. And so this is meant to help offset the costs associated with these systems. Um, and we do still offer these rebates today. So to date, we've had 35 residential and commercial properties in Guelph that have participated in the all season rainwater harvesting and gray water reuse rebate programs. So by using gray water or rainwater instead of treating drinking water to do things like flushing toilets, you know, these systems can really help reduce household water use by um, up to 30 liters per person per day, uh, depending on the size of the toilets installed in the home. And so the rainwater harvesting systems can save even more water by supplying our hose bibs in the summer for outdoor water uses, for recreation, or for gardening. So for those 35 participating properties, uh, we estimated a total water savings of over 960,000 liters per year. So as you can see, even a small number of system installations within our city can have pretty significant water savings. Reducing water also reduces uh, the energy and chemical needs required to provide fresh water to the community and collect and treat the associated wastewater. So we've estimated that the water savings from these systems also have an associated almost half ton reduction in carbon emissions. And so with these residential rebates, we are shifting away from that you know, linear economy model of the the take make waste and moving into a system where our water resources are maintained in the system for as long as possible. And so to create that circular city, we need to ensure that our existing materials are repeatedly cycled instead of being directed to our wastewater. So there's a few key success factors that we believe were important um, in the success of developing these rebate programs. So the first is that we had a really strong city council and staff that are well versed in water efficiency and conservation. Um, and this is just due to our history of developing and implementing programs since 1998. So this meant that we had the background knowledge, experience, and most importantly, the capacity to take on more innovating programs. We also very, have a very highly water literate public. So their knowledge about our local water supply, how finite it really is, and the value of water conservation for our city. Community programs, outreach campaigns, and public consultation processes have really heightened awareness and buy-in at the community level, which you know, you know is the most important piece. If your residents aren't buying into the technologies, it's not going to go anywhere. The funding that we received from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities uh, also allowed us to conduct that full year of testing to determine whether these technologies 
were worth incentivizing. And this enabled us to understand opportunities, challenges, and best practices before moving forward to implement the rebate program. As of 2018, the all season rainwater harvesting and gray water reuse rebates were integrated into a new certification program that we started called the Blue Built Home Program. And so Blue Built Home is really a whole home water efficiency um, certification and rebate program. And so by installing a rainwater or gray water system into your home, in addition to receiving the rebates themselves, homeowners can have their homes certified as a water saving home that helps protect our local water supply. So uh, we've you know, worked to find ways to integrate our programs that were recommended in our 2018 water efficiency strategy uh, into public education and community stra communication strategies. And so the benefits of, of this integration really include reducing our administration costs, sharing in program success, a lot more opportunities for cross promotion, improving our program cohesion, and really strengthening our corporate brand and credibility. So our rainwater harvesting and gray water reuse technologies are still you know, relatively new to, to individuals in our community. They can be a bit expensive to, to install and are sometimes challenging to source. But through integrating this program with our Blue Built Home, we have an opportunity to, you know, even connect builders um, to the program who are building new build homes, you know, to encourage them to include rainwater harvesting or gray water, gray water reuse systems and new builds from the very beginning stages of their project. Builders would receive the rebate and can build the cost of that system into the sale of the new home. And then homeowners really receive the lasting benefits as well as the feeling that they uh, know they're doing something really great for water conservation. We also of course work with homeowners of existing homes who want to start integrating these kinds of technologies into their homes to save money and water. And so as a city, we really look forward to finding new ways to encourage the use of these emerging technologies that have truly such great water savings potential, protecting our local water supply, minima minimizing costs to our community and reducing our environmental impact uh, is really important for us at the city of Guelph. So hopefully that was informative about our home rebate programs. Thank you so much again for having me and I'll be here to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you so much Haley, for your presentation. And um, yeah, I think it was really great to see how um, water protection is mainstreamed in GAF through the strategic plan and that there is a high recognition of the groundwater supply risk and vulnerabilities. Um, and how kind of yeah, reduce and reuse according to the Circuit City Action Framework are really prioritized in what the city does. And uh, once more, um, matching also what Daphne has uh, said in her um, presentation, it's um, I think very relevant to point out the cost benefits that have been generated through um, water efficiency programs. And I hope this will encourage other cities uh, to follow the great example from Gal. And um, yeah, I think one of the points that also came up um, in your presentation and also in the previous one was um, that we really need to think through where clean and drinking water is actually needed and where it is not and what are other ways. So thank you also for providing this really concrete and technical uh, introduction and what can be done. Um, yeah, and uh, congratulations to all the strong work there. Absolutely, um, thanks so much, Rebecca. Great, so... Um, I would now like to um, move towards the Q&A session. So I bring up all the speakers' name again for, um, for you to see. Um, and then um, I think I would like to open um, the floor with a question to all three of you. And maybe just after um, we have heard the presentation that covered many different aspects, and uh, maybe you could provide um, a brief reflection on the challenges and opportunities related to making water systems circular and also going um, again a bit more in depth into the co-benefits that we see from making water systems circular. And I think, um, Haley, I would like to start with you directly. Um, you talked about the social, economic and environmental impacts um, that have been seen also in the work with um, residents. So maybe you could uh, reflect a little bit more on this. 
Yeah, so uh, I mean, from a city's perspective, it's it's great that we can implement water efficient technologies and, and programs from sort of the municipal perspective, uh, but really engaging our residents and, and bringing them on board and getting them involved in protecting their water for the city uh, has been really valuable. In engaging with residents within the city of Guelph, we know that you know water conservation and efficiency is important to them. We really prioritize our public education and outreach campaigns so that everybody in the city is aware that we rely on this finite resource. And so I think by building in these you know, incentives for people to implement the technologies in their home, it, it really provides an opportunity for individuals to feel empowered, uh, to really contribute positively to water conservation, and then to also see that long-term benefit. So for us working with residents in our city, um, issuing any rebates, you know, the biggest thing of getting people on board is what is that sort of return for me? What does, what does that benefit look like to me? And so I think by sharing with individuals, um, you know, how great these systems can be. Yes, maybe the initial startup cost can be a bit higher. You know, we have these rebates to help cover some of those costs, but then really they see that long-term savings on their bills as well. They're using a lot less water and they're really making these positive contributions to our community. So there's a lot of, I think, pride um, with that, with our citizens. Great, thank you so much, Haley. And um, maybe Daphne, would you like to complement a little bit this reflection and also go into co-benefits that you have seen and some of them you mentioned in the example of uh, uh, Leigh in Ladakh already, but maybe um, yeah, you have a, a little bit of a summary here as well. Right, well, I think in the context of water scarcity, of course, it's apparent why water should be conserved. Um, but even in Lay, the water doesn't cost anything. So as long as we can pump it from the ground and it keeps coming out, it's very difficult to uh, convince people that saving water is important. And in Lay, but in almost every other city in the world, it's almost impossible to do any kind of research and say there is only this much water, so we need to use it like this and this. So we try and work with other levers to illustrate um, these co-benefits. So cities need to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So we highlighted the energy footprint of the water system. And if the cities can see that they can uh, save diesel and therefore save greenhouse gas emissions, for example, that can be um, a major reason to save water. So we need to come at it from different angles and see where the points that uh, can make the cities interested and start moving um, in order to tackle several issues with the same measures also to make it easier um, to, to do this. Thank you so much, Daphne. Um, and we, of course, fully agree. So, um, Karis, would you like to also complement uh, these reflections from kind of your perspective as well? Sure, thank you very much. Um, yes, I would just going to underline water scarcity and um, using the water in a um, more resource efficient way. But I think another thing that is really great to highlight is also um, the potential for regenerative use of water. So um, we've heard about the example that I shared previously in Brasilia, how um, they restored the watersheds there. Um, and another um, example that I think is really interesting um, is the sponge city approach. So this is a, an approach that is used uh, in Shenzhen in China and in Porto in Portugal. Um, so there they are using, um, they've rebuilt um, a sponge city park that then enables the runoff of water and uh, improves the risk of flooding um, while also then um, putting uh, more biodiverse uh, land area and in, into the cities. So I think this is also a really uh, interesting approach and shows that um, you can not only then use water in a more efficient way, but then you can also uh, enhance biodiversity and also um, provide more green uh, spaces for residents. Thank you so much, Karis. And um, yeah, Daphne, would you like to also kind of um, yeah, integrate with um, the, the first question that we had on the challenges and opportunities a bit and, and what you reflected on those. So one would be 
um, what can be done in the uh, countries that uh, don't have the need yet so strongly um, to conserve water, to encourage them to follow the example and uh, yeah, do what GALF is doing to um, yeah, um, leverage what's out there actually in terms of so solutions. And the second question would be um, that we can see, and you mentioned the cost uh, benefits and the environmental benefits from um, decentralized water reclamation systems um, and the constructed wetland, wetland systems you mentioned, and what you think are barriers um, causing the reluctance to implement these solutions um, in a broader way. And um, yeah, is it more um, the cost factor, which yeah, is maybe something that could be addressed easily, or is it um, the, the risk of new system implementation, or how would you perceive those? Okay, so may on the first question, um, what could be done to increase water reclamation? So we have a project now in the north of Bavaria that is facing um, acute drought conditions due to climate change. Like in the last 10 years, the amount of water availability is rapidly decreasing. Um, and uh, Professor Dravis, who's the, our chair professor, um, has a project there to recover water from the sewage treatment plant and to um, recycle it for agricultural application and for green space irrigation um, at the city scale. So this is one of the first projects. It's the first project in Germany at that scale. And even in Europe, it's one of the first projects. Um, and I would say that um, not having technical barriers um, is not completely accurate. We do have a lot of technical barriers. We have a lot of technologies and we know that they work, but implementing them in the context of Schweinfurt now, for example, which is our case study city there, it's not so technically straightforward. Um, so we have a very high tech um, process in place with ultrafiltration, ozonation, UV radiation and um, activated carbon. So it's like the Porsche of uh, how to treat water and then it's super, super safe. But even there we're, we're experimenting with what the effect is of that water on growing different kinds of crops. Um, and then the question becomes, how can that be um, abstracted to be a model for other cities? Because there is some national funding involved, but for cities that don't have that funding, how can they treat the water? And what can be a process that is applicable more widely? So technically there are still a lot of challenges and the trouble, as I said, is that we don't have a, um, a catalog where we can say, we want to reduce emissions. So let's pick that one, or we want to do this, let's pick that one. Um, because they, most of these systems have not been implemented at city scale. Um, they exist in individual private companies, for example, but then also if there's only one entity running this, kind of a recovery system, it's it's much easier, or if there's a lot of budget available. So I think a lot of awareness raising um, definitely can help. And also, as I said, implementing pilot projects at larger scales to see how they scale up, to see what the economy of scale is in order to generate numbers, in order to be able to say, you know, this is the price tag that come with these kind of systems. And the constructed wetland to come to the second question, um, and what is um, the issue with that? So. When we started um, working in Lay, we looked at all the different systems that could potentially work there. And because it's high altitude and semi-arid, it had some special conditions. So the winters are like super cold. So there were some a lot of technical things that wouldn't have worked there. And we also picked the constructed wetland because we thought um, it would be good if the local community can run these systems by themselves and they need minimum maintenance. And they're very, very low energy. So our aim, as I said, was to try and lower the greenhouse gas emissions as much as possible. But when we approached the city with this idea, they said, well, then show us the examples where this has been done before. We want to see how it worked in other places. And there aren't any. So if you look at high altitude, cold, arid uh, desert regions in the world, so we looked um, in North America, um, we looked in South America, we looked in China, and we couldn't find um, a system where we could say this is how it should work. Um, so generating this kind of information on how it would work um, here with our capacities and then trying to figure out what the cost would be. It's not an easy process also for these costing exercises. There aren't really any readily, readily available tools um, that we can use a matrix or some kind of template and then say this is what it would cost. 
So even devising like a methodology, now the city has asked us, okay, we want to try it out, but what is it going to cost compared to the centralized system? So we're trying to uh, put a price tag to this thing. Um, it's it's complicated. So in, in that sense, if uh, you know we can collaborate with other partners who have similar interests and can bring different skills to the table so that we can speed up this process of being able to put evidence to this kind of alternatives, I think that would be extremely valuable. Thank you so much, Daphne, and I hope um, this answered the questions that we have received. So um, I have also two questions for Haley that came in. Um, one is referring to the social benefits that you see have been um, generated through the program. And the second would be uh, related to the 50-year water plan that you mentioned. So um, how you would uh, approach monitoring and evaluation of that plan and um, specifically with the recent dry summers that we have seen at the current stage, do you find yourself or Gelf um, where it was expected when the plan was set up or yeah, how would you uh, re reflect on this? Yeah, great question. So maybe I'll touch on our, our water supply master plan first. Um, and you know, kind of how we evaluate and monitor our progress. So our water supply master plan was first drafted in uh, 2006. And so we did have an update to this plan in 2014. And so, you know, these sort of guiding documents are, are things that we do review regularly to see, you know, where are we at progress wise? What do we need to be doing differently to reach our water reduction and efficiency targets? And so we also have our water efficiency strategy that is kind of these actionable pieces that help us meet the goals of our, our larger water supply master plan. Uh, so we had a water efficiency strategy that was created to take us into the end of 2038. Uh, we are now working on another water efficiency strategy over the next few years to really guide our programs uh, better into the future. And so, you know, this will be to help us reflect sort of the current state of things. Um, as you said, you know, we do have, have had a lot of really dry summers lately, um, especially in the city. So one thing that, you know, we're considering um, with our water resource needs is, you know, we're actively using our outdoor water use program. And so this is a program in which residents know um, kind of where we're at. So we're constantly sharing the status of our, our water resources. Um, they know when they can and cannot use water for outdoor water uses in the summer, especially when our, our resources are, are most vulnerable. And so, you know, we actively use our bylaw staff to enforce and manage this, um, you know, despite these, you know, dry summers and potentially lower resource levels, um, our population has been growing, you know, pretty steadily and it, it's expected to continue to do so. But the great thing is when we monitor our water consumption for our city, that trend is still going down. So despite the fact that our population is growing, we are still using less water. With our water efficiency strategies, you know, we're constantly finding or trying to find new ways to um, more aggressively reduce our water consumption and meet these water targets. So some programs, for example, um, are, have a bit more free ridership. So if you consider homes in the city of Guelph that are a bit older, um, at a certain point, the toilets start to fail just strictly because of their age. And so if you go to purchase a new toilet, a lot of the options that exist are really only those high efficiency models. So you don't see you know, huge volume toilets anymore um, in, in a lot of the stores. And so this is a pretty passive way that, you know, I, that we're reducing some of the water demand in the city. Um, but you know, right now we're, we're still really exploring new opportunities to make more of an impact for our water reduction targets. And so you know, this includes an expansion of some of our um, incentive programs, including our Blue Built Home program, which has you know, seen a lot of growth over the last few years, and we expect it to continue to do so. Um, you know, from the city's perspective, um, when we consider the water usage, I mean, if you look at the average water users in Canada, it's about 220 liters a day. The average water users within Ontario, our province, is 184 liters-ish per day. 
Um, but in the city, we're below both of those. So we're using about 160 liters of, of water per day. So it's much less than the provincial and national averages. And so we are working still towards reducing that average use to 150 liters per person per day by 2038. And so this is where we're really trying to bring in more of these home incentive programs, um, educating residents on behaviors that they can change within their homes. Um, and I think this brings a lot of benefit to our community for, for people to feel they have that you know, ownership um, and, and that they have that contribution to our, our water efficiency uh, savings. Thank you, Haley, and I can only once more congratulate you to, um, yeah, kind of working with the residents really to see how um, personal water use can be reduced. Um, there has been one more question directly related to the Blue Build Home program, um, and uh, the question is, where do you think um, the benefits of the uh, cert certification of private households, um, other than uh, the cost benefits, like where do you think residents um, yeah, the, the value of having the houses certif cert certified. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So um, when a home is certified as a blue built home, it means they need a certain level of water savings in their home. So it's not enough just to have, you know, a couple high efficiency toilets. Um, we require that the entire home goes through a home audit. So we have um, staff that do a water audit within the home to look at the residents' water bills, to see where they sit in relation to the city average. They are able to swap out uh, shower heads for more high efficient ones. They can add faucet aerators to faucets to reduce water that's being used um, in all of the taps in the homes. Um, as part of this audit, we also um, have, you know, a couple different options for people to meet the certification level. So if you install a gray water reuse system or an all season rainwater harvesting system, the amount of water that you're saving with those technologies automatically qualifies you for a build, blue built home. Uh, we do recognize that not everybody has the capacity to add those things into their homes. And so to make it a more inclusive opportunity for residents in our city, we have a bit of an a la carte menu, let's say, where if you do switch out all of your toilets, you have faucet aerators and low flow shower heads, all of those small changes together still contribute to large savings. Um, so yes, we do have that you know, water savings for the city. We have the cost savings for the resident because in the long run, they're going to be saving money on their bill. But part of what we're trying to do as well with the Blue Built Home program is when we provide the certifications to residents, it comes with a window sticker that they can sort of proudly display in their home to say that they are a Blue Built Home and that they're doing their part to help protect our valuable resource in the city. And so it's this, you know, really positive um, and kind of encouraging behavior that we're trying to um, portray to residents that we're proud of them, that we appreciate, you know, the changes that they're making in their homes to support water conservation in the city. And so when we give these certifications out and we have this window sticker that we want people to display um, in our certification packages, we also include, you know, twice as many resources because our hope is that they'll keep some resources from their, for themselves and they'll also share those resources with someone else in their community to say, hey, I'm a Blue Belt home and I'm really proud of what I've been able to do to contribute to the city. So I think it has a really positive social benefit. Um, and it's also, you know, a bit of a unique uh, advertising opportunity for them to say they're doing their part within their community. Uh, we've also been working more closely, as I, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, with some builders within the city of Guelph. So if you're purchasing a new built home that you know has been blue built certified, you can sort of feel confident that your contractor is someone who has you know, a very environmentally conscious kind of attitude towards building that they're maybe trying to be a bit more sustainable. Uh, so there's benefits to the to the contractor, I think. Um, and it also, um, yeah, it's just, I think, a really great selling feature and folks know that they're going to save money in the long run. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of really great benefits, not just from a water conservation and cost savings perspective, um, but I really do think it kind of encourages a lot of positive behavior change uh, within the community. 
Uh, thanks, Heidi, for this reflection. And uh, it's nice that there is this dynamic created. I think the circular lifestyles debate is also something that, yeah, we have tried to look into uh, several times under our program. Um, yeah, so um, thank you for that reflection. Um, thank you. I have a last question to Daphne before um, we're going to close this session today. Um, and that also refers to the dry summers that we recently had. Um, so the question is that in what or if in water rich countries like Germany, um, if there are already places um, that maybe uh, need a lot of water where um, the, the level of volume throughput is quite high, where we can already see um, the need and the benefits of uh, saving water. And how would you estimate um, the changes in the future with climate change? And I think we're all a little bit aware about the example in Brandenburg um, that was uh, discussed in the media this summer. So maybe you could yeah, give an estimation and reflection on, on this um, question. Well, thank you for that question. And um, the, it's not such an easy question to answer. I think I, we, even us who, or even the last generation, especially, they were always told to save water, save water. Um, but unfortunately, it's not that easy. If we all save water, then these systems will clog up and they won't work. So in a city like Munich, you can sometimes see a drinking water tanker stopping at a manhole and pouring in a few gallons and thousands of gallons of water in order to flush out some blockage that was created by saving water. So I think we need to differentiate um, what we need, mean by the term to need. So of course in Munich, we have a lot of water and it just flows down from the Alps. Even we don't need any energy to pump it. It just comes by gravity and it's already drinking water quality. So that's a very unique situation. A lot of cities have to bring water from a lot further and treat it in order to make drinking water quality. So there are also the incentives of Munich are low, but the more water we use, the more we need to treat. And there is a big hidden energy factor and water treatment or wastewater treatment is a substantial part of cities greenhouse gas footprint so let's say we want to stop climate change and we do need to think about how much wastewater we produce because we need to treat it to let it back to the environment or to reuse it um, and we can't do it with the system so that means we may need to reinvent the system in a city like Schweinfurt, where the need is so apparent um, there are ways are being found to reuse this water and it boils down to the central question of how much water should also be available for each person um, in order to meet the SDGs, let's say. And in India, for example, and I'm half Indian, so that's also why I like working in, on India, um, there's a, a guideline that says that if cities have a centralized sewage system, they should supply 135 liters per person per day. So that's more than the average that we use in Munich. Um, but if there is no centralized sewage system in place, only 60 or 70 liters per day is enough or 75 liters, so half. Um, and it's because the system doesn't, a smaller system needs less water to flush. But it makes us think if half of that water is just being used to flush these long pipes, and we also know that a lot of the water is lost during the supply, some cities have leakages uh, that amount to half of the water or even more being lost in the supply or a lot of the wastewater also being lost in the collection system which in turn pollutes groundwater um, so there are all kinds of reasons to try and uh, reduce our water consumption but not necessarily in the systems that we have i hope that started to ask the question yes thank you Daphne, and uh, i think um, we all agree that it's a very complex issue to look at. Um, I recall from last summer in the region that I'm in, there was a city where they have a large rich community um, with um, many households with having their own swimming pools and large gardens that already um, there was some restrictions um, needed to be set in place because actually water started to be scarce. So um, yeah, maybe it will be depending also in the future on um, kind of, yeah, where um, the location is, but um, also it makes sense to rethink the whole systems coming back to the presentation that you gave in the beginning to see if there are not other options um, than maintaining old sewage systems or water systems. Yeah, so um, 
I would like at this point to thank um, our speakers and panelists of the day. So thank you to Haley, Daphne and Karis. And I think we have seen really interesting and concrete steps to making water systems more circular. Um, but we have also seen what benefits in terms of emission reduction cost um, savings and others can be generated uh, through circular water systems. So um, before we close today's session, I would like once more to point you towards our Eclipse Circulars platform, uh, where you can find um, information about um, cities that are part of our network and that are already um, active in the field. Uh, you can find news resources and events around the circular economy and also peer exchange and learning opportunities like our webinar today. And also here is where um, you'll find the recording of today's session afterwards. We also encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter um, through that website and where you can um, then also receive information on upcoming events and news um, on the circuit economy. Um, yeah, I think uh, that brings us to the end of today's session. Once more, thank you to everybody who joined us uh, from around the world. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can see the email address here and it's also coming up in the chat. And uh, uh, one last and very warm thank you to our uh, speakers of the day. I wish you a nice rest of the day, mid this, um, morning or um, afternoon, wherever you are joining us from. Um, thank you and goodbye. Bye, thank you. Thank you thank so much. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.